Hello and welcome. I'm Maria Ressa. I'm coming to you from the Philippines, and it is the, an absolute privilege to speak with UN Special Rapporteur David K. David, it is so good to see you. It is the last day of six years, and what a privilege. Thank you for all of the work that you have done. Oh, Maria, thank you so much. And um, I mean, I, I obviously have to start by thanking you for joining me today. It's true, this is my last day as Special Rapporteur, and I'm super excited to talk about it and to talk about the work that you've done and the pressures you've faced over the last several years as well. It's been really an honor to work with you over these many years. I was just thinking 2014, which was when you took this post. I mean, this is the year when everything turned, it began this turn upside down. You know, when we moved from uh, censorship to scarcity to abundance. And one of the things I've loved while watching you and then working with you is how somehow you, you were so agile, you always not just dealt with the problems that were there in the moment, but you were always at the forefront of of understanding what was going to happen next. How did you do this at this time of amazing, of drastic change? Yeah, I mean, first of all, that's very nice of you to say. I, I guess I never necessarily felt that I was uh, at the forefront or in the vanguard of anything in particular. And I think that's because the work of of being a special rapporteur is very much a group effort and from the very beginning i was able to work with with civil society organizations with individuals with experts who were like themselves very much at the forefront and these were people around the world you know some of them were with major international uh, ngos like article 19 um, or access now uh, whom I met with very early in, in my mandate, and they were able to say to me, look, these are the issues that we see, not just today, that are having an impact on digital rights, on access to information, on the media, on journalists, but this is where we think it's heading over the next several years. And so, you know, part of, the, part of my effort uh, was really to learn from the people who've been studying these issues for many years, to, to bring them to the fore, to make them issues not only for our traditional stakeholders, that is, let's say governments, you know, those who have the, the biggest and potentially most problematic impact on freedom of expression, but also on, on companies and, you know, those uh, private actors who have an increasing impact on uh, on access to information, on the flow of information, on freedom of expression. So having that exchange with with individuals, with experts, with organizations was always key to, to my work, to enabling me, I mean, to the extent it seems that way, um, enabling me to stay on top of, of the issues and maybe stay a little bit ahead of them. I think you definitely did that because your mandate also not only, you know, you kept track of both the physical world and the online and offline. And that's, you know, from, from the traditional, the people who had power tended to be older and tended to ignore for a long time what was happening online. And I think this is one of the strengths of the time that you were there. I mean, you, I guess the, the question is, you've seen the trends, you've seen the patterns. Uh, well, while you were doing this, what worried you the most? What kept you up at night? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, so the, the issue for, for this particular mandate, freedom of expression, is that in so many respects, it is everything. It's exactly what you said. It's the physical space and it's the digital space. I mean, one of the things that, that I think became clearer to me over time, but wasn't necessarily, wasn't necessarily as clear in, let's say, 2014, at least to me, was the deep connection between the online and the offline. And that, you know, that goes to all sorts of issues. That goes to the way in which online space is, is a kind of forum for harassment, which 
I would say that early on in the development of the online world, that that harassment was seen as, you know, look, that's just online. Um, that is just, you know, people exercising some kind of robust freedom of expression. But I think, you know, as as long ago as, you know, at least 10, 15 years ago, people people did understand that harassment online wasn't really a, a, a kind of uh, exercise of freedom of expression that was without impact. And I think over the last several years, um, I mean, I've certainly seen the way in which harassment, just to give one example, harassment online, such as the kind of trolling that you've received for many years that you've been on, you know, you've been subjected to in the Philippines and, and elsewhere, that that kind of harassment actually has both online effects and offline effects. It has the effect online of seeking to silence marginalized voices. And I think that part of the dynamic wasn't as clear. I don't think it was as clear to the companies, um, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, even a few years ago. And I think at the same time, the way in which online harassment was translated and converted into offline harms was, was, was less clear. It was clear to a lot of people. You know, for example, my colleague in the United States, Professor Danielle Citron, you know, has been studying this for many years in the context of, of sexual violence, of gender-based violence. But I think that, that it's become clearer and clearer that online harassment, or we could talk about it as online interference with, um, with voting rights or with elections, that that has definite offline harms. And that, I think that trend line has become clearer and clearer to people over time. But you know, as far as what, what keeps me up at night or what kept me up at night or what concerned me about maybe put it this way, because I'm on the West Coast of the United States, so a lot of things were already happening by the time I would wake up, would be what was happening in the, in the real world, in the physical space, which is also a real world. Um, and, and I remember early in, in January of 2015, waking up to the news of the Charlie Hebdo massacres in, massacre in Paris, followed by the massacre in a kosher market in Paris as well. And you know, it was that kind of, you know, connection between the online, the, the expressive part of public space and the potential for violence that, that really, I think, um, has concerned me, continues to concern me today. Over the, over the years talking to you about this because I that's what I lived <laughs> you know it, it really is like and and I think journalists uh, you know we've seen the trend during their the, the the time you've had the mandate journalists have come under attack increasingly and the first attacks are online uh, and these types of I think it the information is power type of thing that the way that facts have now become debatable and I guess uh, this is something you said early on. You said that, uh, yes, you work with governments, but now increasingly private companies have had tremendous power. I would argue private companies now have more power than governments uh, in many instances, especially when these social media platforms are the world's largest distributor of news, right? So we've gone through from the time when I think you mentioned uh, you were coming in after Snowden. Uh, when Edward Snowden did all of these, ec the expose that frankly was being done by government, now you can argue that those same things are, are even larger in scope. The problem's larger in scope, except it's, it's now the power is now being held by American Silicon Valley companies where you are in California. Mm -hmm. How do we handle this? Yeah, I... <laughs> That's the, you know, I don't know what the figure is these days for, you know, the used to be a million dollar question. Um, you know, it's a, certainly a, it's a trillion dollar question. You know, how do we handle this, this new space? And I think, I think it's important for us to recognize that, that, you know, because I think sometimes we get caught up in thinking about 
um, the platforms as the only vector for harassment. And, and that's, to a certain extent, it's true. I mean, the platforms have, as you just said, they have enormous power. They have enormous power in, in particular in places where there is not uh, a, a robust independent media. Um, they have particular power even in democratic societies where there is robust independent media when you know the, the disinformation that we see online gets amplified by, you know, by traditional, by legacy media, particularly by broadcast media. So there's, there's this real, I think, um, warranted attention on what's happening in digital space and what the platforms do, what their policies are. I mean, as you mentioned, I wrote a book on this, but, but I think also that we cannot ignore the fact and we should continue to focus on the fact that governments continue to have massive power. They have the coercive authority of the state. They have the regulatory power. They are quite often, and, and I'm, I'm often concerned that, that we didn't, in the mandate, devote as much attention to this as we, as we should, um, but on a very, very much on a daily basis, governments would look to, to social media they would say, you know, what are our citizens? What are people within our jurisdiction uh, tweeting about? What are they posting on Facebook? What it, what is the YouTube video of the day that they are that they are liking or sharing or creating? And they would go either to the company and say, take this down. We have, you know, a, a significant uh, lack of transparency around that relationship between government demands. And what companies do, although that's improved over the time of my uh, of my mandate, but they also go directly after individuals. They they go directly yeah. to the person like you who is actually yeah. producing content, and that kind of harassment, that direct you know government harassment, that persecution of individuals is still very much a live part of uh, of freedom of expression space, and so. Although I do think we need to spend you know, a significant amount of time thinking about how governments should regulate the companies, we should also be able to keep in mind the fact that governments remain, I think, the most significant abusers of free expression rights of individuals around the world. Oftentimes they're using the platforms, you know, kind of weaponizing them for their own purposes as well, but they are definitely using that space for surveillance, for you know, attack on speakers, and for other other real uh, interferences with freedom of expression, and you've experienced this directly yourself. No, absolutely. And I guess let's start let's start first with governments, then let's go to companies, and then all of the other things that have everything to do with tech, right? The uh, yeah. the algorithms that determine what kinds of what we even see, how we pull, how our data. So on the government side, mm -hmm. uh, you your mandate was the time when we began to see a dictator's playbook come together and the rise of these authoritarian populist style leaders who uh, used social media. Uh, they were elected and democratically, uh, democratically elected and then were began to use those physical world things to use the tools of democracy to consolidate power using not just the real power of government, but also amplifying their power through the new technology that was available. What was it like to work with governments during this time period? And Because that's significantly different, right? Uh, and then, you know, mm -hmm. what worked most effectively? Mm -hmm. There, it's, a, it's such a great question. And I want to put a pin in this also because I want to circle back to your own experience and talk to you about that because I think that will be really because uh, your experience was one of those. Your, I mean, your continuing experience, frankly, is one of those that has really informed my understanding of the of the, the issues that we're talking about today. Um, I would say, you know, it's not it's not really possible to characterize interactions with governments as one thing only because there's such diversity in, in the way governments behave toward 
uh, toward this space of, you know, towards digital space, towards independent media and so forth. So, you know, for example, you have some governments like, you know, I would say some of the Scandinavian governments, uh, some, you know, other European governments um, that, that have been very open in their way of thinking about digital space, um, very open about what, what they understand. And here, like to get into a little bit of a, um, you know, uh, international human rights law distinction, you know, we often talk about negative and positive rights, right? You know, what government, to put it like bluntly, what government is obligated not to do, and then also what government should do in, a, in an active way to enable particular environments for, for the enjoyment of human rights. And I think there are some governments that, that still see their role primarily as enabling freedom of expression, right? Um, creating a, a regulatory environment that is very, very light, um, uh, if at all, on regulating content, um, but very strong on you know, providing, say, public service media, uh, public broadcasting, um, supporting independent voices. Like those kinds of governments, those are the governments that are, I think, traditionally in the Article 19 of the Universal Declaration and the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights. They're in that space where they genuinely believe uh, and implement, you know, the essential features of freedom of expression. Those governments are, are pretty easy to work with. They, they've been supportive of the mandate. Um, I would especially highlight uh, the government of Norway, governments like Netherlands, Austria, um, others that have been real uh, robust supporters uh, of the work that, that we're doing. By, and I would also say that Europe, the European Commission, which actually provided a grant to my mandate and to a couple of others at OHCHR, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, also has been very supportive of our work. And we could talk more about regulation in the, in the European context as well. But I would distinguish that from the kind of you know, heavy handedness that we've seen in places like the Philippines, you know, with its cyber law cybercrime uh, regulation, which is being abused to target a person, an independent journalist like you, um, or governments like Turkey or Egypt or others that are you know, quite regularly interfering with, with digital space, with independent media going so far in those two examples, Turkey and Egypt, but many others um, going so far as to uh, to detain journalists merely for their posts or their likes on uh, on social media. So I think over the course of my mandate, I've tried to distinguish those, but at the same time recognize that that the rights apply across the board. Everybody enjoys rights, and the obligations apply to all states. And this, I mean, to give just one of our most recent examples in in special procedures, that is you know, the, the branch in which all special rapporteurs uh, kind of work with in OHCHR, um, you know, China has been, we, we've almost ignored China to a certain extent over the years because its intense pressure on freedom of expression has been so evident to, to people. But I think that, and I, I, I'm overstating by saying that we, we've ignored it, but, but it's come to a, a particular head over the last few years with the um, incredible, I think, crimes against humanity that involve freedom of expression, you know, with respect to the Uyghur community in the far West or what we're seeing right now in Hong Kong. And, and we are sort of trying to direct more and more attention to that and try to ensure that the international human rights community plays, uh, uh, places a particular value on ensuring freedom of expression, even in that space that is so difficult to um, to advocate for. So, I mean, I, it's just such a variety of governments. It's hard to put them all into into one basket and say our interactions with governments are are this or that thing. No, no, no. I mean, you did. You know, I was slightly disappointed because it did take 
you're right that you you did uh, talk about EU, the Nor Norway, and all. Of, but in general, when journalists were under attack, and partly after the election of President Trump in the United States, you know, it when when we were trying to fight for freedom of expression, for freedom of the press, it was. It, it took until July of 2019 when Canada and Britain began uh, pulling governments together to stand up for it, like actively to help protect uh, journalists like us yeah. who've been under threat. And that's very welcome. Also, Article 19 was there at that meeting in London, right? I, I guess I'm, I'm yeah. on the part of the digital authoritarians. What worked best mm -hmm. with them? Because in general, Again, it seems like we're in an Alice in Wonderland world where everything is upside down. And you know, when you take yeah. the phrase freedom of expression, um, it changed drastically. What worked best when you deal with things like that? When, and, and you mentioned some of those countries already. Yeah, can, maybe if we could just take a second and I can ask you also about your experience, because I think that would sharpen, I mean, I do think it would sharpen this, this question because I think what, what you've experienced, I think, um, in a way that people recognize worldwide now, but I think was, um, was new to people a couple of years ago, was the intersection of government repression and intimidation and uh, the, the use, the misuse. Though I don't really like the term weaponizing, but, you know, the development of... of basically troll armies to harass you and to silence you. And I wonder if you could, so as we move into that discussion of kind of digital authoritarianism, what, what, was you, what has your experience been? And maybe I could, if I can ask you a question, when did the pressure on you uh, start? I, I assume it was soon after you founded Rappler.com. Like what, what did that look like? Because you started it before Duterte came to power. What, what did that look like? How is, and how has that evolved? Because I think your experience is, is a kind of quintessential experience that people, uh, independent journalists face everywhere. I mean, it paralleled the rise, you know, we started Rappler in 2012 and the goal there, we embraced technology to build communities of action. So it was really, you know, investigative journalism coupled with tech. And then using that, we could build communities. And the end goal was to make our world better, right? Like everything else. That was 2012. Yeah. Um, I think everything changed and we didn't realize this, but in 2014, you can see kind of, uh, uh, Globally, you can see this this push towards uh, leaders who could just take away the problem of the complexity of the world. And I'll, I'll look at like India and then Indonesia, large populations, right? And so there was that human thing that the world had just gotten so complex that you know I can't think through it all. Please just give me a leader who will tell me what to do. Uh, and we saw that shift. I, when I covered the Indonesian elections between Jokowi and uh, the former, the son-in-law of uh, former President Suharto, who had been in power for 32 years, when we start, when in the Philippines we didn't come under attack until 2016, and I, I think 2016 is when the, all the dominoes began to fall. And I would say the Philippines was because we were a testing ground for a lot of these tactics of mass manipulation. The election of President Duterte, I, I would say, is legitimate. Absolutely. He did use social media. He was the first to use it to win the top office. Uh, but in 2016, we began to question impunity of the drug war, a brutal drug war, and impunity of a propaganda war. And this is where it all began. And I think, unlike you, I'm really convinced, I'm because of what we've lived through, that it begins with... Uh, these lies that are seeded to attack journalists, human rights activists, in our case, also opposition politicians. So the attacks against me began online first uh, after we published a three-part series, The Propaganda War, where we actually showed you what was happening because we live on social media. So we felt the tenor change immediately, and it was in 2016. Um, uh, after Duterte 
remember Duterte was elected in May and then Brexit happened a month later and then that's when the rest of the dominoes fell. Our three-part series was that um, the weaponizing the internet. The second was how Facebook algorithms impact democracy because that early we really could see it and feel it. Uh, and then the third was manufactured consensus, how 26 fake accounts could, could influence 3 million others. We manually counted that and that horrified me. And we were essentially alpha partners of Facebook. So I brought this data to Facebook. Anyway, when we published the series, all of a sudden, that's when I got pounded with 90 hate messages per hour. And that continued. And the, and you said this, the end goal of that is to pound you to silence. So that takes, that takes a journalist out. And it was so new that we didn't know what it was. No one knew how to deal with it. Uh, we learned um, and then I, the second part is to create a bandwagon effect that wasn't real. I mean, Oxford University coined manufactured consensus. That makes sense to me now. But how it changed over time was more interesting to me, right? This, um, I've talked to you about this, how journalism, journalist equals criminal. You pointed out this is used everywhere around the world, but in our case, that narrative was seeded on social media in 2016. In 2017, uh, the astroturfing bottom up was met top down by President Duterte saying the same thing. And that was pounded a million times. So more and more people were getting slowly sandwiched. The air is coming out. Then in 2018, weaponizing the law, 11 cases and investigations, 2019 arrests, eight arrest warrants two arrests in five weeks, detention. And then 2020, the, these cases have been ongoing. And then in 2020, a conviction in June 15th. So journalist equals criminal, which was far-fetched in 2016, because I thought, wow, I've been a journalist a long time. There's a whole track record. Doesn't matter. Track record doesn't matter because you recreate reality online. And I guess this is, we can talk more about what men, you know, what, why facts are debatable. But then by 2020, here it is, a court has convicted and journalist is equals criminal. That's crazy, David. You know, so how do we protect? This has also been one of the things you've had to deal with. More and more journalists coming under attack, uh, trying to hold power to account. Brilliant summation of the last several years that you've lived. And one of the things that I think is really important about what you just described is this accretion of repressive moves, right? So on the one, it starts with, with investigative reporting. I mean, this is a tr something that I've seen also around the world. It could be investigative reporting. It could also be independent bloggers who are either reporting or doing opinion work that is somehow out of the mainstream. So it starts with it starts with content, with expression that is somehow at odds with the, the conventional uh, sense of what either society or what government wants. And mostly it's about what government wants media to say. So there's that substantive element at the beginning. And then there's, I think what you described is so important because we've seen this time after time. It's this redefinition of journalism, of the sharing of information as criminal. Um, you know, in a place like Turkey, it's, you know, journalism equals terrorism, right? If you're reporting yes. on yeah. the situation of the Kurds, uh, you know, you're a terrorist. Um, if you are reporting on the a coup attempt from July of 2016, which is also happening during this period that you're describing that early period, well, then you're also, you know, you're a Gulenist, you're a part of the, the coup plotters. So there's this redefinition in law. And I think that's, that, that is particularly important because that, that legal change part of it is also what is then used by government. And this, this was, I think, a very, I think, nefarious use of this by, by the government in the Philippines against you, which is they create the law they, they allow this law, this cybercrime law to exist. And then they make it available to individuals, to ostensibly non-governmental individuals to enforce it against you. 
And then the government says, what, this isn't about us. I mean, this isn't, this isn't government action. This is, this is a private actor who is claiming defamation by Maria Ressa and Rappler. I mean, that's, that's clever, right? But ultimately, it is about that, that change in law. And then when you layer on top of that, the actual, you know, the, the computational propaganda side, the, the manufactured consent, the manipulated consent that you describe, which is, is extra legal, you know, it's a, it's a kind of perfect storm. I hate to use that phrase, but it is kind of a perfect storm of kind of government repression mixed with, um, you know, the, the advent of, of mass trolling, which um, is designed to silence opposition and not just opposition, because I mean, my experience has been journalists don't want to be framed as opposition. You're independent actors who are conducting, you know, investigative work, trying to, you know, get at whatever kind of facts and truth we can ident- you can identify. But, you know, that's, that's undermined by, by all of these things. And I guess I'm, I'm curious, from your perspective, what should be social media? What should be the platform's role? I know in the Philippines, you know, Facebook played a major role in this, but, you know, it's not just Facebook. It's in some places, Twitter. Um, in others, it could be YouTube. In others, it could be, you know, it could be WeChat or, you know, Contact. It could be, you know, any of these different uh, actors out there. And I'm curious what you or TikTok, you know, what, what, what do you think the companies should be doing in the face of what is admittedly, you know, government pressure, government demands? Yeah, it, it's interesting when you when you put it that way. So, like in the in the Philippines, the the penetration of Facebook, a hundred percent of Filipinos on the internet are on Facebook. It is our internet, but ninety eight percent are on YouTube, right? The penetration rate of YouTube, which is the world's second largest mm-hmm. uh, search large search engine, is huge, and they go hand in hand. So it isn't just one uh, uh, one thing or another. They're all interconnected. And uh, anyway, so uh, what should they do? So I- I'm curious to hear what you think, because in my mind now, increasingly, I went um, early on to say, no, there should be no regulation. Because I've because as a journalist, we are self-regulating, right? And, and we've had a set of standards and ethics uh, that we go by. We protect the public sphere. We are accountable for protecting the public sphere when we distributed the news. Yeah. So I think the first step for me is that the platforms need to own the problem because journalists, news organizations no longer distribute the news. Technology does. And uh, in many ways, uh, abdicated responsibility for the public sphere because the way the social media platforms are are designed, uh, it doesn't prioritize facts. And there's no accountability for the exponential spread of lies. So uh, behavior-wise, what we've really seen is that uh, lies laced with anger and hate spread faster than the facts, which are really boring. So that's that's part of it. That that one thing um, has has made facts debatable. I think that's the other problem mm-hmm. that I see in the design is that built into the design is us against them. Uh, this idea of growth coming from recommending friends of friends has actually divided democracies divided everyone and it becomes an us against them because it's you know it's a spectator sport that's how the mm-hmm. the cluster how human behavior has shifted to it and i guess the the most radical thing uh, that i've embraced in the last 4 years is that these platforms are not they are behavioral modification systems if you take them as a whole and then let's bring in the rest of of what technology's brought in, right? Data, data privacy, data protection, um, artificial intelligence. When you take all of that and uh, you you combine it with micro-targeting, uh, you can essentially, mm-hmm. these platforms know us better than we know ourselves. And they sell our weakest moment to a message to a company or a government or anyone else uh, so that we, or serve that message at the optimum time 
to change the way we think. So behavioral modification yeah. system. I've seen it work in government propaganda. Uh, I have not done anything different. Uh, next year will be my 35th year as a journalist, and I am, you know, following the standards and ethics that I've that we always have. And yet, journalism is equals. From, I, I've been convicted. I could go to jail. That's crazy. Enabled by tech, and so yeah. that's the that's the struggle for us. And you know, we've leaned on you. For anyone who doesn't know, of course, David K. Um, also uh, uh, filed an amicus brief in the cyber libel case that was went on trial last year and uh, on June 15th, uh, I and a former colleague of mine were convicted of cyber libel, a retroactive application of a law. So thank you, David. Mm -hmm. But his wonderfully written amicus brief, which I got to read, is, was dismissed by Judge Montessa as noted, one word, noted. Right. Mm -hmm. That's true. I, so <laughs> before we get to that, um, I, you know, on the on the social media companies and their responsibilities, you know, I um, so I, th this is I think it's a it's a complicated situation for for all of us, in part because, you know, over over time, you know, we have we've, we've really we haven't fully learned what, for example, you mentioned, you know, the AI tools that are engaged in, sh in in providing us in serving us up with with information we have limited insight into how those operate and you know for from my perspective i mean one of the things that we've been trying to to call on on the companies themselves to do in order to to address all of these different problems that were that you've just described and that we're we're talking about is to is to look at these problems and to look at their products, right? To look at their platforms, and by products, it could be, you know, the AI tools, the, um, you know, the algorithmic uh, functioning of their of their platforms. They have to look at them and ask, what are the human rights implications of every single product that we are presenting to the public? And and do basically a an impact assessment. You know, we talk about environmental impact assessments for you know for all sorts of projects that might have an implication for the environment or or for climate or or other issues we should have those for human rights as well those should be standard and i think one of the things that that we've tried to do in the mandate um, is i mean or that i've tried to do as special rapporteur and that my co colleagues other rapporteurs have tried to do is to look at the tool of the UN's guiding principles on business and human rights, which are, you know, a, a non-binding set of, of standards that say, you know, governments have the obligation to protect human rights, but companies, which are not, you know, formally bound by human rights law, they do have a responsibility to ensure that their products don't interfere with the human rights of people. And they should have human rights policies. They should have, and, you know, it, as part of human rights policy making, they should be transparent about the nature of their products, what they've done to analyze whether those products do have an implication for human rights. They should be able to share all of that information with experts. You know, one thing, if you talk to any researcher in, um, you know, in the field of, of digital rights or of the internet and society, it is extremely difficult to get access to the underlying data that, that companies have, which is massive, um, and to actually study the, the behavioral and human rights implications of those products. Those should be made available to researchers. Once we have that, which we don't have now, I think we're in a better position to, to really promote uh, and identify specific fixes that should be undertaken by the companies. Right now, we, we just, we don't have that to a very significant degree. And I think that's been that's been a hindrance in, in part also, you know, because and you said this, I think, at the very outset, you know, a lot of a lot of the people who are involved in regulating um, the Internet or media around the world, they they may tend to be, um, you know, uh, have let's say they've grown up in an environment that is non-technical. 
that does not involve digital space. And, um, and I think that when we start talking about algorithmic transparency, for example, oftentimes those people don't, you know, they don't engage in that conversation. It's a little bit frightening to them to think, oh, this is math, this is gonna be hard. But I think we really need to, and this may be a generational change issue, we really need to get to the place where particularly transparency regulation, disclosures by companies becomes a part of the norm that's required by government regulation. That, that's gonna have to be a, an essential part of how we move forward. Well, this, you know, using human rights, uh, the UN Declaration of Human Rights as one of the, the ways to actually start thinking about for, for the social media, for these tech companies, Silicon Valley, let's put it that way. Uh, uh, in speech police, you said they should bring this in. And yes, we've seen some movements, you know, they've hired people who are, who are doing human rights, but beyond that, mm -hmm. you're talking about wanting data, but the reality is the impact is already very clear. You know, we can, quant researchers can quantify the data and come up with more nuanced reactions, but that's, I guess, if you're like me, you want it right now. We know, yeah. you know this, in your book, in Myanmar, it's been proven. The UN did their own report, uh, Marzuki Darusman from Indonesia led that team and proved that um, social media was a factor in genocide, genocide, yeah. right? We've, the stuff that's happened in other parts of the world, this is already proven. No one is held accountable and human rights are frankly trampled. My human rights have been trampled. What do we do in the, in the short and medium term? Yeah, this is, uh, so this is really important. And that, this, is, this is why there's, there's so many different discussions around the impact of social media, right? So one is the algorithmic and, and the, the, the manufactured consent that you were describing. And then there's the other, which is, you know, and Myanmar provides a really good example. And in fact, I think over the last couple of months, looking at the debate, how the debate has changed in the United States provides uh, an interesting uh, set of insights around this as well. So in the case of Myanmar, you know, Facebook, and, but this is true of all platforms, they have extraordinarily limited insight into what is happening at local levels. And that, that's not just sort of the national levels, you know, what was happening across Myanmar or what was happening in Rakhine State, uh, what was happening to the Rohingya community. It's also at the, you know, what, what Chinmay Arun calls the hyper-local. You know, it's what was happening at the level of, you know, towns and villages where people are using these tools in order to share information. Some of the information they're sharing might be disinformation. A good portion of it, particularly in the Myanmar context, was information about where the next threat of violence might be coming from. So it could be protective. But the problem was because of the platform's just complete dominance of information in that space, they had a special responsibility and continue to have a special responsibility to, you know, one, ensure that local communities have some kind of ownership of the platform. You know, what that means exactly is, is up for some very serious thinking and debate. But right now, you know, local communities and national communities have virtually no ownership of this, you know, of the, or, you know, these sets of major tools, these major platforms of, of public space, of public debate. You know, it's like, I mean, I, I imagine this as, um, you know, a, a situation where you have, you know, a dominant public forum, and it's all being run by people who have no idea about what that public involves. And we need to get to a point where, you know, there's often a, a discussion, and this just happened in the United States yesterday, you know, discussion of antitrust and breaking up companies. To a certain extent, I think we should also be talking about whether the companies need to be somehow broken down. Like, how do we get them to be closer to the communities where they're actually regulating public debate, where they're actually regulating public space? That, that for me, is a, is a real major problem. And I think we've seen this in a, in a kind of, in an odd way in the United States, 
over the development of the Black Lives Matter protests. So, you know, I think Rashad Robinson was was on, did a, a, a fireside chat earlier in the week for RightsCon. And, you know, what he's done in um, and with, with Anti-Defamation League and with others in terms of highlighting the role that the platforms play in spreading hate. Um, that's been extraordinary. And it's really gotten the attention of advertisers in the United States. But what's remarkable to me is that this is only happening now. You know, this kind of action against, in that case, against Facebook, you know, it's only happening now. Like, so employees are now, you know, the companies are, are um, kind of organizing themselves uh, and complaining about the way executives are making decisions on issues like hate speech and racism and white supremacy on the platform. But, you know, for Facebook, the platform is global. You know, only about 10% of the platform is, is its user base is in the United States. So where has been the outrage over all of these other kinds of issues, you know, particularly the kind that you've described in the Philippines, where's been the outrage, the action when it comes to the global situation? And I think that's something that, that the, it's not just the companies, but we as, as advocates, as um, as researchers, we need to come to terms with, you know, this is, you know, we're, we're not just talking about problems in one particular space. We're talking about this happening. You know, we're talking about, you know, for example, the impact of Facebook on the U S yeah. elections. Yeah. Well, it's happening yeah. everywhere. It happens in the elections in the Philippines. It happens in elections in India. I mean, you can go on and on about where it's having that impact and the discussion tends to be limited to those environments and there's not a lot of response from the companies in the way that we're seeing the response right now in the United States. Yeah, and and actually that's why uh, it's, so the few things that you said, you know, number one, uh, how do they get to know the communities? Well, when I had to set up the Jakarta Bureau, I spent months, years, understanding the legal system and the communities that I was going to be reporting mm -hmm. about. And even as a reporter, I couldn't really, there's always a gap between a Western news organization and the and the Southeast Asian countries that I was reporting on. And that just took time. So I think in some ways what you mentioned, which is how will these platforms, how will these companies understand the local communities? It takes time. And the problem is that they did not invest in the people and they did not invest in time because exponential growth that allowed for more money also meant that they did a one size fits all and the countries like Myanmar, like the Philippines are not there. You know, we're not, despite all of the negative yeah. effects, I always say, you know, the global South deals with Silicon Valley's decision. So that's the first, how do you get them to deal with community? Sure, they've hired more people who speak the language, but that's like, that's not even it. So, and then the second thing you mentioned, stop hate for profit, right? The whole mm -hmm. goal of all of the exponential attacks is to incite hate. Uh, I think, again, over the last four years, I've just been recently showing all of the things that are meant to dehumanize me. I see it. I wake up to it. And when I show, show this to, you know, to, to the public, to something that we, people get shocked because it's so, it's so visceral and demeaning. That is what it's meant to do. So, yes, I'm thrilled Sacha Baron Cohen did that the Anti-Defamation League is doing that work, but the journalists, women in particular, because in the Philippines, for example, women are attacked 10 times more than men. Um, we, this is what we're living through. And the end goal of all of that inciting to hate lead, can lead to violence. I, this is what I worry about for Rappler and for our team. Online violence leads to real world violence, something else that we know, right? Um, so. Mm -hmm. I, this is already a given, you know, how, yeah. how do we, how do we get some sense of, how do we get some protection? Yeah, I, you know, on this, on this last point on the impact on, on women journalists in particular, and the kind of, I think, imbalance <laughs> in terms of, of attacks, I, I'll just give one example or it could be two examples, actually, um, 
So over the last several years, I've collaborated closely, as I think people know, with Agnes Calamard, who's the special rapporteur on extrajudicial killings and summary executions. Um, we've collaborated in the context of the attacks on the media in the Philippines. Um, and we've also collaborated in the context of the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, the Washington Post uh, correspondent, uh, opinion journalist, um, who was murdered by by Saudi by by Saudi officials? You know, I think um, in, it, it certainly appears with the involvement of uh, the Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman. So, in, in those contexts, we've both been pretty vocal about our concerns, both of government repression, government intimidation, and the role of of other governments in in their silence. And, um, and, in, and in the context of social media. In each of those contexts, Agnes is the one who has suffered the most in terms of trolling, attacks online, um, basically Twitter campaigns against her. And I, you know, as a, as, you know, I think a white male who's also involved in this, haven't, I have not received the same kind of, of attack. It's just, I think, an example of the way in which this attempt at silencing is is not only prevalent, you know, against journalists, but also human rights workers, and it has a, I think, a differential impact often uh, on on women in these cases. So I, I mean, I think what you know what we're talking about when we talk about harassment and silencing, it's it's clearly not just about silencing of journalists and investigative. Uh, people in, in, in the field of human rights, but also you know, people who are doing the work as mandated by the UN Human Rights Council to collect information and report it to the international community. Um, yes, I think, again, the work the two of you have done have been amazing. Um, can, can I bring you back, because we're running out of time. We have a, a few minutes, yeah. and, and I definitely to have last words. But one last big question I have is, uh, again, it goes back to this idea of how facts are now debatable, how we have alternative realities. Uh, to hear that come out of the White House was also interesting for me, right? Uh, but in, in a time like that, where we know we are being actively manipulated, geopolitical power play has gone down to the individual level. Uh, and what like this when so when it is like that, is it even possible to have a democracy? Do we have integrity of elections if we don't have facts? Yeah, I mean that is Maria. That is a huge question, right? And I think I think that um, all too often we're not having that conversation. You know, we're not having that conversation about the way in which, well, let me maybe step back a little bit and be, be a little bit more specific. Um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg gave a big uh, kind of well um, uh, reported talk at Georgetown last year, where he talked yes. about the commitment of Facebook to freedom of expression. And I think that that's, you know, I, I think that's that's valuable. I'm, I'm obviously a special rapporteur on freedom of expression to hear a CEO of a platform say freedom of expression is essential to our work. You know, that's that's heartening. That's that's nice. The problem is, and I think this isn't just a, a Zuckerberg problem or a Facebook problem, but it's a problem perhaps for social media and also maybe for all of our understanding of what what freedom of expression is. I mean, the way Zuckerberg talked about freedom of expression, and also, frankly, the way the debate over Trump's tweets that, that really uh, were on the edge, if not involving incitement to violence during the Black Lives Matter protests, I think the, the assessment was somehow that because he's a politician, he has a particular right to speak that is different from the ordinary citizens right to, to speak. And I think that's that's actually not the right way to think about freedom of expression. And I mean, this gives me a chance to, to, to you know, quote Article 19 
of the National Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which again, echoes the Universal Declaration. And Article 19 guarantees everyone the right to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers and through any media. But that, that core, it's about seeking and receiving information in addition to imparting it. So it's not just about the speaker. Freedom of expression is also about, about the audience. And you know, I don't want to overstate this because, like as you mentioned at the beginning, um, you know, you were wary of regulation at the outset, and I'm very wary of regulation around disinformation, in particular because it's often used by authoritarian governments to shut down independent journalism. You know, false information. Uh, prosecutions and so forth that we've seen around the world. But I think it's important for the companies to conceptualize freedom of expression, not just as the right to post, but also to conceptualize it as an understanding of what it is that individuals are capable of receiving. And disinformation on the platforms, as you've described it, you know, in the context of, you know, manipulated consent, trolling, which the companies, I think, at the working level understand is a problem that they have to deal with. And we see this in different different ways. But freedom of expression also involves our right of access to information. And the kind of trolling, the kind of intimidation, the kind of disinformation that we've been talking about and that we see regularly is a form of interference with the freedom of expression that we all enjoy. And I think that that conceptualization is really critical to understanding what it is that companies should do to address it. And that goes to you know, disinformation around elections, disinformation around candidates, and, and so forth. And the companies just need to be devoting uh, a huge amount of resources to that, to the transparency of, of advertising that's political, to all sorts of other issues that give us insight to who is behind certain kinds of content that really involves disinformation and is not about kind of promoting the, the you know, public square, public debate uh, and access to information. I think that's really important for us to, to wrap our heads around. I think it's also clear, you know, the, the rules that we live by in the real world, uh, you know, what they can also, they should work online in many ways when you attack somebody. A lot of the things that you talked about, uh, in some ways are uh, still looking at content moderation. I'm now a fan of regulation because I think it's the only thing that's that mm -hmm. can do something, but not necessarily content, right? Um, we are running out. We have two minutes left. And I guess, you know, I it, it, you've had an ama a, a great mandate over a transformational period of time. Uh, let me mm -hmm. give you, you know, your closing thoughts and... Uh, you know, as, as you move on, you're still going to be with us, of course, and we're looking forward to still working together. But I guess, you know, how do you how do you think of it on the last day? What things have you have, yeah. have worked and what things do we need to work on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to to summarize in just a minute or two. But I think a key issue um, is, is almost more of a tactic. It's not a strategy. But the promotion of freedom of opinion and expression is a group effort. You know, it's not, it's not really, it's not uh, within my power or any special rapporteur's power. I mean, even to say we have power is a bit of a joke because we don't have power necessarily. But I think that we have the ability to serve as a platform for voices that are often not heard. Um, to serve as a platform for ensuring that these issues, which are not just national issues, you know, these are global issues that we're talking about, and they require a kind of, you know, not strict consistency, but they do require, certainly for the companies, a global approach. And and I think that, you know, as a as a tactic, it is essential to continue to involve civil society in all of these discussions. And, and I guess my fundamental plea to governments, particularly those at the Human Rights Council, is that those governments create space 
for civil society to participate, that they create space for independent media, that they approach regulation, not from the perspective of content only, but from the perspective of you know, how we ensure that people have adequate information to make decisions about the future of digital space. Uh, I, no, thank you. Agree with all of it, all of your insights. I mean, I'm, and I'm going to quote um, Quinn McHugh from Article 19 when she described your intellectual fierceness. I like that phrase. Um, uh, we are at the at the end of our time, David. Thank you so much, and thank you for the privilege of having this conversation with you at the end on your last day yeah. as uh, on your UN mandate. Six years, an incredible six years, and. You know, hoping that we find the way forward now. I have skin in the game Thanks, on that Maria. one. I'm Maria. Thank you. Thanks.